Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to the second uh, of the ICCT's webinar series on uh, vehicle and fuel standards in India. My name is Joe Schultz. I'm the Communications Director for the ICCT. And before I turn this over to Anup Bandavadakar, our, present, our presenter, just a couple of brief housekeeping details. These will be familiar to those of you who were at our first webinar. Um, we expect the presentation to take about a half an hour. There will be time for discussion afterward. Um, during the presentation, we'll keep everyone on mute, and that's just to preserve the audio quality. Um, if you do have a question during the presentation, there's a way to type that in using the control panel in your uh, webinar software. And our other panelists, Gaurav Bansal, will be monitoring those and uh, can respond to them in real time or pass them on to Anoop, uh, depending on what makes the most sense at the time. Um, following the presentation, uh, we'll open the floor for questions and comments. And uh, we'd ask you to just raise your hand using the webinar software um, if you have something that you want to say, and then we'll unmute people in order. Um, and just to keep the audio quality good again. So with that, with no further ado, uh, let me turn this over to Anoop um, to talk both about the series and the ICCT and, and, uh, and then we'll get started. Thanks very much and welcome. Thank you, Joe. Um, I hope everybody is now uh, listening to the webinar. Uh, and so as Joe said, good evening or good afternoon or whatever uh, it is. Uh, this is this is the second in our series and today's uh, webinar is really titled pretty much the same way. Uh, but before I get started, let me just say uh, for those who are of you who are not familiar with the ICCT, uh, who we are and what we do, uh, and we are really a, a technical organization. Uh, our goal is to uh, eventually work in all of the 10, 11 top vehicle markets of the world uh, focused on uh, two main issues of concern, that of air quality and uh, fuel consumption or greenhouse gas emissions from all modes of transportation. Uh, so that includes uh, on-road passenger vehicles and heavy-duty vehicles. Uh, it includes aviation and marine sources, as well as all the fuels that go with it. Uh, and uh, at, at present, most of our work is really focused in China, Europe, US, uh, as well as India and Mexico, uh, with a little bit of work in some of the other uh, countries countries where we have active participants. Uh, the motivation for this particular webinar or as well as webinar series is really something that we discussed last time, so I wouldn't really go into uh, any details. Uh, but it's really the health impacts of uh, vehicular air pollution that we are concerned about. Uh, and this is an older data from 2005. Uh, that sort of suggests uh, more than 150,000 lives are lost each year in India due to uh, premature mortality resulting from uh, fine uh, particulate matter, the PM 2.5 uh, alone. Now, as time has progressed, as emissions uh, have risen somewhat, uh, the impact is likely to be worse. Of course, this is impact from all of outdoor uh, air pollution activity. Uh, and certainly vehicles are one uh, of the many sources of this pollution. They are not necessarily the only source of uh, this pollution, but they are one key source uh, of this pollution. Uh, and that's, that's what we are here to uh, talk about and discuss. Uh, and, and, and the background really goes into the study that we are conducting uh, at this uh, moment uh, to assess how has India done uh, with respect to its uh, vehicular air pollution control program, uh, what's really worked, what hasn't really worked, 
uh, through a few different lenses of vehicle uh, standards, fuel standards, compliance programs, and new kinds of vehicles that come in, uh, as well as efficiency program. Uh, and, and that report should be released in, in a few months' time, and, and we are using this uh, as, as, as a tool to start dialogue around the issues of auto fuel policy in India. Uh, and so this is the beginning and as, as I said, sort of a dialogue. Uh, so all your comments and uh, criticisms are welcome. Uh, as I said today, we will focus on the fuel quality standards and compliance program. For those of you who were here last time, we discussed mainly the vehicle emission standards and the compliance program and we looked at how uh, Indian vehicle emission standards are something between six to ten years behind much of the rest of the world and we really don't have a roadmap going forward. Uh, there are things that could be done but of course it uh, hinges uh, on to uh, the part that we discussed today that is the fuel quality in India. Uh, the third webinar, uh, which will be a month from today roughly, uh, will uh, then take these emission standards uh, for vehicles, the fuel quality standards issues, and then put them together in the context of what, what really are the benefits uh, from doing more stringent standards, what really are the costs of going towards more stringent emission control technologies on vehicles, uh, on cleaning up the fuel itself, uh, and how do they stack up against the benefits uh, that will result on the health uh, part. Uh, uh, to, to just launch into the material itself, uh, I, I would not try and go through this slide uh, in entirety, but essentially it's there to show that uh, fuel quality is integral to the efforts to control vehicular air pollution, that it's not all about the vehicles. And in fact, as we often say, uh, we need to treat vehicles and fuel as a system, uh, that together, uh, cleaner vehicles and cleaner fuels is what makes uh, lower emitting vehicles possible. Uh, and there are a variety of parameters uh, that affect uh, vehicular emissions and of course we've gotten rid of lead uh, in India uh, and pretty much by now most of the world uh, but the other ones uh, parameters that are remaining that do affect uh, emissions of uh, oxides of nitrogen or uh, hydrocarbons or particulate matter are, are really critical uh, and, and as we will discuss, sulfur really is the linchpin in all of this, uh, but emissions uh, that result from having a higher aromatic content or uh, what evaporative emissions uh, do with respect to the vapor pressure of the fuel that's indicated here by the vapor pressure factor are important. And, and there are slightly different uh, sets of uh, parameters with respect to the uh, fuel quality effects in when you look at uh, diesel and there's a little typo here. Uh, so uh, different fuel quality uh, parameters do affect uh, vehicular emission and we can sort of go into some of those details later on. Uh, but uh, what, what India has really accomplished uh, in terms of uh, improving fuel quality is again uh, something that uh, we have uh, said last time with respect to vehicular air pollution control that uh, if you look at the last 10-12 years a lot has been accomplished uh, that uh, of course lead was gone well before the last round of uh, auto fuel policy uh, but the sulfur content of the fuel has improved dramatically uh, down by a factor of 10 uh, from 2,250 or in gasoline or petrol or, or about uh, to 350 parts per million uh, on, on the diesel front. Uh, and some cities have made further progress uh, in terms of going to slightly lower levels of uh, fuel. Uh, there has been corresponding increases in uh, octane number uh, of fuel. Benzene level in gasoline has come down uh, towards 1%, which is really good. And there have been now controls on aromatics in fuel. Uh, something that we will not necessarily discuss in the, in the webinar side, but 
we can certainly talk about in the Q&A side is um, the other fuels such as uh, compressed natural gas or uh, liquefied petroleum gas and that use has really increased uh, over the last 10 or 12 years, especially in the urban transit buses and uh, the three wheelers, the auto rickshaws in uh, India. Uh, but their market share remains sort of you know, on the passenger vehicle side, about 5%. Uh, a fair number of three wheelers now get made in CNG and quite a few of the city buses. Uh, and those are inherently lower uh, M sort of cleaner fuels when you compare to the present day uh, diesel and petrol. Uh, to sort of launch into the things that maybe aren't working so well and, and let's sort of confront straight away the issues uh, with respect to uh, making sure that the fuel quality that is promised by the present day standards uh, whether that's the same quality of fuel that's uh, available to the end consumers. Um, and certainly uh, there is efforts in that direction, but, but when we try to look at what is being done in other parts of the world uh, uh, to ensure that the cleanest fuel gets to the consumer and, and we look at India, there are certain differences that, that come up. Uh, and, and not that there isn't testing of fuel quality in India, that it happens at the uh, refinery level, it happens uh, at an independent testing lab that exists just outside of Delhi, uh, but it's nothing compared to, uh, let's say, Japan, which has got the same number of fueling station. I mean, last, as the, earlier this year, uh, India had about 45,000 uh, petrol stations spread out all over the country. Uh, Japan, incidentally, has about the same number of fuel stations. Uh, and uh, of course, the size of the country is much smaller, but it's important to note that all the service stations are tested at least once annually uh, in, in Japan. Uh, there are about nine different labs uh, spread out across the country. If you look in the US, there is a lab fairly spread out, mostly in all the states, uh, that uh, tests uh, every batch of fuel that goes uh, into the uh, end delivery. Uh, if you look at the way a liability for poor fuel quality is uh, uh, assessed uh, really and how the penalties are assessed, uh, again once we see a difference between who's held responsible uh, and, and who's not, if whether all parties across the chain, whether that means not just the refineries, but the transporters and the retail stations uh, in, in US or in the Japanese context, all of them uh, get held responsible uh, for, uh, so they need to demonstrate uh, that they have done their part in ensuring the fuel quality. Uh, and certainly uh, there is a less amount of tracking uh, compared to, let's say, the centralized designate and track system that EPA uses uh, to track all fuel uh, that's supplied for on-road vehicles nationwide. Uh, and a system like that, um, it's a logistical uh, challenge, but not something that cannot be overcome in order to ensure that really the quality of fuel uh, that is produced uh, and delivered to the consumers is appropriate. Uh, the other issue uh, that has not really been addressed uh, at all is that of vapor recovery. Uh, uh, certainly as uh, tailpipe emissions of uh, uh, hydrocarbons uh, come down, uh, vapor uh, from uh, fuel refueling really uh, start to matter in terms of the total contribution of uh, vapors in the uh, total hydrocarbon content. Uh, this sort of chart tries to just show what has really happened um, in many of the developing countries and sort of this phase one or the stage one of the vapor recovery phase. That's really the part uh, which uh, is uh, the part where uh, vapor from the fuel tank uh, as well is uh, recovered at the time of uh, refueling the petrol pumps fuel tank from the transporter's vehicle. Uh, 
Uh, and this is something that started to happen quite quite a few years, I mean, I would say a few decades ago now uh, in some of the developed countries. And that's been followed since what is known as the phase two or the stage two uh, of the vapor recovery. And so while phase one is really to make sure that as the uh, level in the tank uh, goes down, uh, as the fuel in the tank goes down, the rest of the tank gets filled with this vapor. Uh, of course, that's related to how much the temperature is and what's the vapor pressure and all of the other parameters, but, but essentially you don't want that vapor to just escape to the atmosphere. Uh, so while phase one addressed the vapor uh, and the tank and during the refueling from uh, uh, the transporter's vehicle to the fuel station, phase two really concerns with the vapors uh, here in the vehicle's uh, tank, again, the same kind of action that's taking place uh, and ensuring that all of the vapor that is um, uh, I mean effectively captured uh, and, and the loss of uh, not just the basic uh, volatile organic compounds uh, that sort of include, uh, again, emissions that result of uh, BTX, the so-called the benzene and toluene and xylene kind of emissions, which are again toxic, uh, are, are captured. Now in some parts of the market, and really only mainly in the United States, but um, uh, the recovery of the vapor on board uh, is, is done through something called as the onboard vapor recovery or ORVR. Uh, so instead of uh, using a stage two control, what one can do is to uh, use a carbon canister that is actually there on board, but its size needs to be adjusted uh, for onboard vapor recovery and capture the vapor uh, from the fuel tank uh, that to be used uh, at a later stage. Uh, in several states uh, in the US, for example, now both of these systems are in progress, uh, although you know, the difference being the stage two controls uh, can go into effect relatively quickly, uh, although uh, their longer term effectiveness is dependent on very continuous monitoring um, uh, and slightly lower efficiency than the ORVR program. Uh, on the other hand, ORVR program can only really apply to new vehicles that come into place. So it will take 15 or 20 or 25 years really before all of the vehicles are covered by ORVR. Uh, of course, in the Indian context, we have to pay special attention to the case of the uh, motorcycles, uh, which, which are really a big uh, uh, part of the vehicle fleet. And uh, while there are ORVR systems that have been demonstrated, at least in California for motorcycles, uh, whether they can be effectively deployed uh, for all of the motorcycles in India is, is still a little bit of a question. Uh, and so, uh, but really so sort of considering stage two vapor recovery options may be uh, a useful strategy uh, at present. Uh, uh, moving on to sort of the next and, and the more important sort of subject is that of the sulfur uh, content of the fuel. And as we sort of said, uh, sulfur content in uh, India and fuels in India has come down dramatically to about 150 ppm for uh, the country and about 50 for some 20 cities. Uh, same kind of goes for diesel that uh, 350 ppm for uh, most of the country and 50 ppm for uh, some 20 cities. Now, if you compare that with the real, relatively advanced vehicle markets of the world, uh, you see sort of a time lag anywhere between five to eight, nine years in terms of uh, getting to this really ultra low sulfur fuel, the, the fuel that it would be would call generally 10 or 15 parts per million uh, in terms of uh, its sulfur content. And uh, that's a, a really a key issue. And uh, in fact, you know, we would say that this is the linchpin in India's efforts to control uh, vehicular emissions going forward, especially uh, you know, given that the heavy trucks that run on diesel are the biggest contributors to uh, vehicular emissions. But certainly as the market share of passenger car diesels is increasing rapidly in India, uh, 
controlling uh, diesel sulfur content and um, getting the emissions down becomes critical. Uh, and, and, and sulfur by itself is, is, is quite important. So what this chart is trying to illustrate is the impact of fuel sulfur level on vehicle emission factors. At least this is the way we modeled uh, based upon available literature. And what this chart is trying to show is, uh, let's say you have a vehicle emission factor of one uh, at a sulfur content in fuel of 500 uh, in diesel. Uh, or, or gasoline, and how vehicular uh, PM or NOx emissions get affected. So as you can see, if at the beginning of the century when Indian uh, fuel sulfur content was in this 2000 range, uh, emissions were about 25 to, to you know 75 percent higher depending upon where you were looking, uh, compared to the level that is in the diesel today or in the gasoline uh, today. Uh, but of course, as you go down, as you keep reducing sulfur content of fuel from 500 to 350 down to 150, 50, or even 10, uh, there are further dramatic uh, reductions in emissions from the same uh, vehicle. So in without changing uh, vehicle uh, after treatment, uh, emission reductions are possible just by having cleaner sulfur fuel. Now that's a key point that that reducing sulfur content of the fuel has benefit by itself, uh, but then we would of course sort of see how it has other issues. So what we try to illustrate here is what would happen in India if all we did is cleaned up the fuel sulfur content. Uh, so sort of this upper band indicates the reduction in uh, PM emissions, so total PM emissions. Uh, just by moving all of the country to 50 parts per million uh, fuel quality uh, in terms of sulfur content. And then what would happen if we further reduced it down to 10 ppm in another few years time. So by 2016 or so, we were all on 10 ppm uh, sulfur fuel. Uh, so of course we would uh, gain anywhere between 6, 10, 12% reduction in emissions. And these are very important reductions, but of course a lot of emissions are remaining. And that's really the key point that reducing sulfur content is important in itself uh, to gain these reductions. But what is what it is more important uh, is what it enables in terms of vehicular uh, emission control devices. Uh, and I like this figure because it sort of illustrates the impact that uh, uh, cleaner sulfur fuels can have in reducing diesel emissions. Um, and, and what this uh, really shows is uh, an uncontrolled diesel exhaust, which is really what we used to have in India at the turn of the century. Uh, and where we have sort of progressed through Euro 1, 2, and sort of 3, the Bara 3 emission standards on which most of the trucks fly today is, uh, is about at this level, uh, that most of these now have a diesel oxidation catalyst on them. And so that's reducing emissions, uh, but nowhere near really where uh, at, at lower sulfur level, you could have what is called a partial filter. Uh, but, but really what the ultra low sulfur fuel, the 10 to 15 parts per million fuel enables are the so-called diesel particulate filters. And these diesel particulate filters are really effective in terms of, as you can see, sort of the dramatic reduction in terms of the exhaust that comes out of the tailpipe uh, in reducing not just the overall particulate matter, but reducing and capturing uh, ultra fine uh, particles, the uh, really the so-called black carbon content of things, um, the ash that gets formed due to burning of lube oil and, and so on. Uh, and the sulfur content of the fuel is the enabler uh, for effective use of uh, these filters. Uh, so even at 50 ppm, these filters would work, but, but not as cleanly as shown here. Uh, but 50 ppm uh, is sort of the uh, threshold which would really enable uh, these filters to be put on and they would perform more effectively once we move to uh, 10 ppm level uh, fuel. And so with that sort of in mind, we sort of created a scenario. This is one plausible scenario that sort of, you know, very aggressive in its uh, thinking to say, okay, you know, what would sort of world-class emission 
program in India would look like, that if India were really to move fast and you know, get 50 ppm sulfur uh, by the end of next fiscal year in India, uh, and then sort of kept on that push over the next several years to have uh, 10 ppm sulfur fuel over the next uh, four years or so, uh, and couple that with uh, a really strong emission control uh, standards, uh, force down, as we discussed some uh, the last time, uh, better enforcement and compliance programs over, over this decade that reduces, uh, we've sort of used the proxy of vehicles that grossly pollute, and at the same time kept on increasing the market share of uh, sort of those relatively cleaner CNG or LPG uh, vehicles in the light duty as well as uh, heavy duty side. And so what this kind of a scenario suggests is uh, it could achieve dramatic overall reductions in particulate matter emissions. Uh, this scenario in particular suggests up to 70% uh, emissions can be reduced uh, on, on the particulate matter emission side uh, by 2020 itself compared to the trajectory on which we are presently uh, and what could be achieved. Uh, and, and these are the things that the low sulfur fuel really enables. And this is the chart that shows overall emission reductions possible with NOx. And again, 60% is, is quite a dramatic reduction when uh, you consider that uh, throughout this period, Indian vehicle fleet uh, will continue to grow in size uh, and, and don't really see that growth slowing down for quite some period of time. And to be able to achieve emission reductions of this order is, is quite dramatic. And, and I think that should illustrate the importance of uh, better fuel quality uh, and emission standards in India. Uh, this is where we are, uh, back to sort of you know, where, where reality and uh, where things are at present, that we have a BS4, the Euro 4 equivalent fuel in about 20 cities. Those are illustrated by stars on this chart. And uh, where all the refineries in India are, and some are being built, I mean, this one in Orissa, the part of these refineries just been built. Uh, some have been recently completed, like this Batinda refinery in, in Punjab. Uh, some are real, relatively big uh, uh, refineries, while some others are smaller. Uh, but certainly, uh, it's 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 not effective policy to be having uh, 20 cities in the country to be on one slightly higher emission standard level, uh, while rest of the country really has uh, the BS3 fuel and uh, emission or fuel quality and emission standards. And really all the heavy trucks, again, as we discussed last time, uh, because they are flying all over the country, are really refueling on BS3 fuels, and so no, nobody's really making BS4 trucks in India at this moment. So while it might even appear that there are BS4 standards in effect in 20 cities, uh, only really the city buses that are being made uh, are, are uh, BS4 equivalent uh, when it comes to heavy duty vehicles. Uh, heavy trucks elsewhere in India are all still at the Euro 3 level, which is uh, an important consideration. Uh, so what, what we are doing uh, uh, at ICCT is trying to understand what is it going to take uh, to get to these cleaner uh, ultra low sulfur fuels in India. Uh, and we are working on a study uh, with Hard Consulting and MacPro to evaluate what would be the cost of this transition. Uh, and, and the transition is really going to be uh, coming through upgradation of the existing refineries, uh, uh, but also in the new refineries that are coming out and specking those to meet Euro 5, uh, 6 uh, vehicular fuel quality. Uh, and what we assess are really the additional refining costs associated with these ultra low sulfur fuels. What would it cost in terms of capital charges or operational changes that would need to be made uh, for better hydrogen or to make sure that the fuel quality parameters other than sulfur are also kept uh, in check. Uh, and I wouldn't go into a lot of details of this. I'd be hope to present uh, 
some study results in the next webinar. Uh, but really the way we are thinking about uh, this is through uh, certain notional refineries uh, that, that have been modeled for India, sort of the large export refineries like the Reliance and SR refinery in Jamnagar, uh, but some of the more uh, advanced refineries which have got um, better uh, equipment already to do some of this hydro treating required to get to ultra low sulfur fuel. And these refineries are characterized based upon their size, the amount of crude that they process at present, uh, whether they currently use uh, lower sulfur crude as their input or a higher sulfur crude as their input and uh, all kinds of other parameters including the new refining capacity that is being added to India at present uh, because uh, India is one of the few countries around the world which is actually adding significant amount of new refining capacity uh, and uh, several of these are being already uh, built uh, to make cleaner fuels to begin with and we could take full advantage of that uh, capacity. So uh, just coming towards the end, uh, what what's, seems to be inhibiting the progress uh, for cleaner fuels in India is of course, going back to the issue from the last webinar is we really don't have a roadmap. Uh, what the uh, petroleum ministry has announced is that 50 more cities would be added to the list of cities that currently have BS4 uh, quality fuel. Uh, and while that's progress, that's really still not going to get uh, the fuel country wide and just probably not a good uh, long term development. Uh, the ministry has indicated that it has taken an in principle decision to formulate auto fuel policy for 2020, but the uh, details of that are not yet available. Uh, the other factor that sort of confounds this and it's sort of very current given sort of the fairly steep increase in petrol prices in India uh, yesterday where the prices went up by more than 10% uh, for petrol uh, just the day before. Uh, but, but the prices of uh, other fuels and diesel and even kerosene for other uses is still uh, very much controlled. And uh, the oil companies do have a legitimate uh, excuse, uh, if you will, in terms of uh, why all these investments in ultra low sulfur fuels cannot be made. Uh, that uh, the under recoveries uh, that for large part government does uh, pay back to the oil companies, uh, even though they have to, oil companies have to sell the fuel at uh, below where it would come when you take into consider cost plus taxes. Uh, it, it still uh, makes the cash flow situation of the oil companies a little bit tenuous, and, and so these under recoveries really are uh, an issue that we cannot just uh, forget about. Uh, but the fact is that uh, uh, especially having cheaper uh, quality uh, of uh, cheaper uh, amount of kerosene uh, uh, available uh, doesn't create some adulteration to take place, uh, which is uh, one of the issues. Uh, as we discussed, uh, there are really no vapor recovery controls in, in India. There are, isn't really a lot of testing going on uh, there. So uh, our preliminary recommendations really coming from this as for discussion here are that really a, a move to 50 ppm sulfur nationwide should, should really be a no brainer. It should really be expedited uh, uh, much faster than what it seems to be uh, done now. Uh, and of course, eventually the transition to 10 ppm uh, needs to happen, uh, which would really enable this. Uh, but of course, there are other things that could be done that are independent of this uh, that uh, talk to the enforcement uh, aspect of side and the how often and how the uh, testing of fuel quality is done. Uh, it should not be unreasonable to expect uh, having uh, an independent fuel testing centers in different parts of the country. Uh, so that uh, would really be uh, quite effective. Uh, the stage one or stage two vapor recovery uh, options uh, would really uh, 
can be done independently of improving refinery uh, characteristics. Uh, and of course, at, at the political level, which is a very hard issue to deal with, but it, it probably has to be dealt with uh, sooner rather than later is that of fuel pricing quality. And so I'll, I'll kind of stop at that level to open it up uh, for questions and, and discussions. I already see a few uh, questions coming and Gaurav well, has been answering some of them in the chat window. Uh, listed here some of the materials that we are putting up uh, as we are progressing through our study, uh, materials from the previous webinars, but also some of the briefing papers that we are developing along the way. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, we can take questions at this uh, moment. So Joe, uh, if, if you do have questions here, we can sort of enable those. Uh, I do see some, a couple of questions here in the control panel that, that Gauro has been uh, addressing and let me sort of just uh, make a note that uh, certainly that that a question has come that saying isn't isn't really going towards onboard vapor recovery a more effective option as a national policy than going to stage two vapor recovery uh, because again sort of it, it's going to require uh, effective monitoring and controls uh, and and so the it, it's really about how what where and how to implement uh, if it was a way to go where for it the brush and of course that is that is correct that um, the US experience at least has shown that the onboard vapor recovery over uh, a longer period, uh, appears to be more efficient and in fact what is what what just happened in the US this past year is uh, that uh, since the US EPA has determined that uh, more than 90 percent of the vehicles in the country now uh, actually have uh, or close to 90 percent have the onboard vapor recovery options that stage two uh, controls would no longer be mandated uh, in areas that uh, still have uh, ozone problems. Uh, that ORVR as it sort of keeps on percolating uh, throughout the fleet would, would make uh, sense. And certainly in the Indian context, even if uh, the sales have been growing fast, but they would keep on growing a lot more. So there is a lot more fleet growth yet to take place in India. And in that context, really, uh, uh, if we had implemented ORVR at this stage, uh, then uh, they, that would really have an impact. Uh, the other factor really that is, that is important is uh, there are certainly areas uh, when it comes to ozone that are uh, sort of dependent upon the NOx emissions in the region as opposed to the VOC, the volatile organic compound emissions in the region. And uh, certainly the vapor recovery makes the most sense immediately where uh, the ozone is sort of VOC constrained as opposed to sort of the NOx constrained. Uh, the second kind of a question that, that came up on, on the chat really is about um, uh, sort of measurement of em emissions and, and, and sort of uh, the total amount of investment that, that needs to be done and so on uh, and, and certainly what could be done uh, to improve eco driving habits uh, especially of uh, heavy vehicles and so on and that's certainly a, a very valid point that uh, very simple and effective voluntary programs even uh, to improve uh, driving characteristics of vehicles uh, or drivers, uh, really uh, uh, reducing and to the extent possible eliminating idling of vehicles which is largely unnecessary uh, for most part would, would definitely help. Uh, and having of course uh, having fuel efficiency standards for all kinds of vehicles both passenger cars and heavy trucks would be uh, very helpful, uh, but uh, certainly uh, that makes sense. Uh, they, there is sort of, uh, Let me just uh, cut in here briefly to say there's a couple of questions coming in, but uh, just to remind people that if you'd like to 
uh, just ask your question. Um, just raise your hand using that control panel and we'll unmute you. There's a, I think a, a recent question from Vedant Goyal, and I'll just unmute Vedant right now. Hello? Hello. Yes, you're on. Yeah, uh, could you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to understand how does the government decide which cities get involved in implementing Park Ford technology? Is it voluntary? So if, if it's voluntary, then we have to move with the municipal corporations to promote implementing Park Ford and get asking them, uh, educating them the benefits of it. Uh, sure. Uh, so what has happened in India is uh, the first phase of the auto fuel policy that was formulated in 2003 uh, really recommended uh, a two-tiered approach uh, that they only recommended uh, about 11 cities, which were some of them were the largest cities like, you know, all the metros in you know, Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai and so on. Uh, and then a couple of cities were added to that list later on, like Solapur was one of them, uh, which sort of just kind of indicated uh, very recently. And then seven cities that were added just this year towards BS4 are really the cities that are closest to the refineries. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of effort involved in transporting the cleaner fuel to them. Uh, now you are absolutely right, uh, Vedan, that, uh, you know, if more cities really understood the importance of this, they would also be clamoring for uh, getting the, the lower sulfur fuel. And, and I mean, for, from a, a speaking at a personal level, it, it does feel kind of, you know, why, why should 20 cities in India have access to better quality fuel and emission standards and why uh, is an air pollution in the other cities not important? Uh, and, uh, and and certainly it's an issue, and, and, and the more demand that comes from the local level, uh, I think the greater the pressure will be. Now the ministry uh, on an, its side has indicated that based upon availability of fuel and logistics, uh, they would gradually uh, make progression to 50 cities. Uh, I don't think they have quite determined how they are going to do it, but I think if at the city level more and more demand comes, I mean, they've indicated that they'll first go to all the state capitals and then start connecting more second tier cities. But I think the underlying demand would definitely drive it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, th there is a question that's that's come uh, on uh, on the message box, but if there is any other question on the audio, uh, Joe, we can take that. Otherwise, I'll respond to this one. Yeah, sorry, no one's got their hand up anyway, Anup. So, uh, so go ahead, Chair. Okay, I mean the question that's been tagged in here is is in is in the fuel quality issue also concerned with the implementation of IM programs in India uh, and what kind of a mechanism would enable fuel quality testing within the framework of IM programs. Uh, actually, uh, we, we, this is, this is even though, I mean, I think we always talk about vehicle and fuel as a system, uh, the compliance programs as they go sort of the inspection and maintenance on the vehicle side and on the fuel quality side are, are actually different in the sense that the parties involved in making sure that uh, uh, either vehicles are produced to the specifications that are uh, set in the type approval and the users that are making sure that the vehicles are in good condition and really the goal of the IM programs in the vehicles is to ensure that vehicles are that are driven on the road are safe and are meeting the norms uh, to which they were designed to control emissions. The fuel quality side of things uh, is, is completely independent of these, that uh, users of vehicles have little control over fuel quality, uh, except you know if they know uh, a particular petrol pump uh, that has got a cleaner fuel. 
Uh, and so as such, the parties uh, that are responsible for ensuring uh, quality of fuel are different from the parties that are responsible for ensuring that the vehicles are in good condition. Uh, but of course, as in the overall context of the auto fuel policy, uh, it certainly makes sense to tackle all of these issues together. Uh, but I'm not quite sure whether uh, the fuel quality testing could happen in the same framework as that of the IM program. It it uh, it looks like there's some uh, discussion from Vivek Srivastava. So uh, maybe I just move that to the audio. Uh, 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 <laughs> Vivek, you should you should uh, you're unmuted now, so you could go ahead. Hello. I think the audio at my end is pretty bad, so I just wrote that question. Audio at my end is pretty bad, so I just wrote that question. There's a question from Peter. I think uh, as he, he he just said that he he's having some audio issues. Perhaps his phone is very close to the oh, okay. something like that. Uh, but so he was just kind of typing. Well, uh, let me let me just uh, let me just paraphrase uh, Mr. Sivastava's question there that he typed into the question pane. So he's talking about uh, evaporative controls and the implementation of, of specifically stage two and ORVRs in India uh, and the challenges of doing that uh, and what are the options are. So maybe Anup, you could speak to that. I tried to answer it, but uh, it would probably be better if you spoke about it rather than attack it. Certainly, uh, I think I. I, I tried to say a few things about it uh, when we began this discussion. Uh, that if you if you look at sort of how the progression happened in let's say let's pick the U.S., which is really the biggest country with ORVR in place, that uh, stage one controls uh, happened quite some time ago. Uh, and stage two control sort of happened uh, phase wise uh, as sort of the problem of evaporative emissions became more pertinent. Uh, and ORVR essentially uh, took quite a bit of time uh, to get regulated uh, in part because initially some people had concerns about safety, whether that was the prudent strategy, so on and so forth. Uh, now, over the last decade, uh, ORVR has proven to be a more cost-effective program and more efficient program in the U.S. context. Uh, if you look in Europe, uh, Europe strangely uh, is uh, doesn't have any ORVR, and uh, part of that reason is historical. That some of the countries, uh, like Sweden, for example, went ahead uh, uh, quite early ahead of others in implementing stage two emission controls on their fueling stations. And some other countries sort of followed suit uh, one by one. Uh, and the issue of uh, evaporative emission control was never a part of the discussion on sort of the Euro one, two, three, four, five, six emission standards. And so that was left uh, mostly at country uh, level uh, operation. And since uh, you could not really have uh, a one unified vehicle market in Europe uh, where vehicles routinely cross boundaries uh, and have uh, some countries implementing ORVR while others having stage two controls. And so essentially there has been a slow drift towards uh, having stage two uh, controls uh, across Europe. Now, as in the case of India, as I said, uh, of course, given since the vehicle fleet in India is young, uh, if ORVR to be implemented now, uh, over a long run, it would likely prove to be the more effective uh, uh, and efficient program uh, on passenger cars, uh, certainly. I mean, one has to remember that the vapor recovery issue is mainly a, a petrol, a gasoline vehicle problem. It's not such a big issue with diesels. Uh, but uh, 
one of the concerns in India should be uh, whether we can implement an ORVR system effectively uh, for uh, motorcycles in India, which are also one of the key sources of uh, evaporative emissions. Uh, in the absence of effective or cost-effective uh, ORVR systems for motorcycles, it might make more sense, uh, at least in the short term, uh, for India to be investing in stage two controls. So I think it's 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 a more a nuanced uh, issue that I don't think there is a clear cut yes and no answer that you know India should do ORVR or not do ORVR, uh, but. Um, I think the motorcycle issue is, is, I think, important, more important in India than, say, in the U.S. Uh, any other questions, Joe? Uh, none. I think we're still having some audio troubles with uh, Mr. Srivastava. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't look like he can... Uh, you can do this by audio, um, but but I think you've covered everything. Okay, that's great. Um, well, I mean, we don't we don't need to hang hang on to the call if there aren't uh, a lot of other questions. Uh, uh, there's a couple yeah. hands up here. Uh, Anand Gopal, uh, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm sorry. My question may be relevant because I was I was only able to join late. Um, I guess uh, I have a not necessarily a regulatory question, but more along the lines of uh, what the future is going to look like. And uh, the key thing that I was wondering is if you guys have done any analysis on because India is going to be defined in 2025 by mostly new vehicles and new the fleet turnover or the fleet composition is going to be made up of a lot of vehicles sold from between now and then. Um, is and and knowing that generally air pollution has sort of an 80 20 rule with uh, you know 20 percent of the vehicles being responsible for most of the 80 uh, 80 percent of emissions um what what is the strategy and which class of vehicles do you think are the key to target in that time frame is knowing all these facts uh certainly uh it it, it, it is quite true that uh, uh a lot of the older vehicles, uh, especially older diesel trucks and buses, uh, are actually responsible for a large uh, fraction of uh, present emissions in India uh, and will actually continue to be so for a long time for the reason that even if you take the BS3 trucks that are being produced today, uh, they will be in operation for a long time, much beyond actually 2025 uh, to come. And that's why really essentially the question of addressing uh, heavy duty diesel vehicles is of primary importance. Uh, and, and that's the reason to focus also on improving fuel quality is that not only does fuel quality enable more uh, effective after treatment technologies on future vehicles, uh, it also helps even with the BS3 trucks to bring down their emission levels if the uh, fuel quality were improved. Uh, certainly if India were to consider uh, a scrappage program for heavy trucks uh, we have the ability to actually model it. We haven't quite modeled it properly yet, uh, but uh, I'm just so speculating a, a bit that uh, we would see actually quite a bit of an effect on overall uh, emissions if we were able to uh, put in place and incentivize properly uh, to ensure that these trucks are actually scrapped, that the engines aren't really being used somewhere else for some other purpose and so on. We might actually make a dent in the short run. Uh, but of course, over a, a period of 10 or 15 years, it's really a combination of cleaner vehicle emission standards, cleaner fuel, retirement of the older vehicles, and making sure that the inspection, maintenance, and compliance programs are working properly. Thank you, Anup. There is a, a other question from, I'm sure I'll mispronounce his name, Gandhart von Remdonk. I'll uh, 
Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, my question was in line of my of the previous question. Um, I'm a researcher of the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering, and next to improving the quality of fuels, but can also improve the efficiency of the complete vehicle. I try to reduce the required power by means of uh, improving the aerodynam aerodynamic drag level of uh, heavy duty vehicles. Uh, because when a heavy duty vehicle is driving at higher velocities, and more than 50% get lost to aerodynamic drag. Is that something that uh, India is considering uh, in their development towards uh, lower emissions, uh, also to give attention to um, more aerodynamic designs, more lightweight designs, and uh, mm -hmm. like? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, so let, let me sort of bring it back just one level back and, and bring mm -hmm. it tied to the overall issue of fuel efficiency of the vehicles themselves. And India is in the process of uh, regulating uh, passenger vehicle fuel efficiency and will likely come up with some standards later this year. Uh, there hasn't been a regulatory activity on the fuel efficiency of heavy duty vehicles, but there are a couple of voluntary efforts uh, along the lines of, let's say, the US EPA Smart Way program um, or sort of the Green Fleet or Green Freight program. One of those yes. programs is has been started by a Clean Air Asia uh, initiative, uh, the Clean Air Initiative Asia initiative in, in India. And they have partnered with uh, several of the uh, logistics uh, organizations. The second effort that is just about being launched, uh, actually this week there is supposed to be a seminar in, in Delhi uh, that uh, Deutsche Post and DHL together uh, are uh, in a partnership uh, to again try to encourage efforts that uh, focus uh, not just on sort of improved aerodynamics, uh, you know, whether it's adding side skirts to the trucks and so on, uh, or just making sure that the airflow is smoother, uh, but also having uh, more efficient tires uh, on vehicles, uh, making sure that idling is uh, minimized, so on and so forth. So all of these so-called eco-driving measures that uh, are being suggested right now at a voluntary level. Uh, there isn't a regulatory driver at present, but certainly all of these efforts would be useful. Okay, thank uh, you. Good. Looks like uh, another question from Vedant uh, Goyal. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add up to Anup's uh, comment. I am part of GIZ, who is uh, we having the conference on green freight technologies. We just started today. So what we found is from the private uh, freight companies, they are very much ready to implement the greener technologies in the freight sector. But the issue what they are founding is the policy framework with, of the government, which are not consistent, uh, sometimes are vague, and sometimes are not promotional. So what they are requiring is to have a general framework in which we, they can work and just orient themselves so that it incentivizes uh, everybody, right from the users to the uh, promoter. Uh, thanks, Vedant. And, and, and if you if you wanted to sort of, I think uh, I, I learned about, uh, I think GIZ itself had sent an uh, invitation to us, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. But if we would be happy to share that information on, on our blog itself so that uh, people, all those who attended uh, today's webinar would also know about your initiative. Surely, I'll do that. Um, Joe, if, if no other questions, then I think we are we are coming to the close of the hour, so I wouldn't necessarily want to just hang on uh, longer if there are no further questions. Sounds good. Uh, great. Well, let's wrap this up then. Thanks again to all the all, all the attendees uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks to Anup and Garag for their work on this. Um, just a, a reminder, there will be a third uh, uh, webinar in this series coming up in about a month's time and uh, we'll make sure that you all get notice of that and uh, look forward to 
seeing you there. Um, and please, again, don't hesitate to get in touch uh, with us with any follow-ups. Thanks again. We'll close this up now.